Yo, what's going on? It's someone that's someone, and welcome to this video. We're just going to have a brief introduction here, but we're trying something a bit different with this format, as we normally only cover one report. But we'll be trying these compilations out just to see how they work. The reasons being, one, you guys. I do get quite a bit of comments saying you guys want long videos and whatnot, which I totally get that. Some people just want to put something on and have it play for a while. So instead of waiting for a long report, we'll have these collections for you guys. The second reason being that this will allow me to get a lot of the older content back up. If you don't know, we had to remove a bunch earlier this year due to the guidelines. So instead of redoing each one one by one, we'll group them together like this. The third reason being this does add a different perspective, especially towards a substance or a state of being. And the fourth reason, just being honest, a algorithm. I've seen a lot of videos like this recently doing really well on YouTube, and you guys already know we've been growing for a long time now, so we'll do what we need to do. But besides that, I do want to know the quality will be varied. I would freeball it a lot of the time back in the day, but it is what it is. We made that video like that at the time, and we'll just leave it like that for authenticity. But that's all I really got to say. If you guys want to see more videos like this, you already know, hit the thumbs up, subscribe, leave a comment. But without further ado, let's get into these stories. You took too much, man. This is a story of how my psychedelic year 2012 and how it ended horrifically. I've been going through what exactly happened that day and processing the events that led to it. It has been my intention for a while to write an experience report about it, but it was not until today that I decided that I'm ready. Before I begin, here's some background. I'm a guy from Northern Europe. I weigh about 65 kilograms or about 140 pounds, so needless to say, I am and have always been quite slim. I enjoy coffee and weed, and I've been a cigarette smoker and an addict for a couple of years now. I'm a quiet guy and some would even say introverted, but I don't know. I enjoy the company of friends, preferably with cigarettes and beer or weed. I've been slightly depressed ever since this incident, but haven't gotten around to getting an antidepressant prescription, I don't really need it that much anyway. It didn't seem like it then, but now that I think about it, the year 2012 was filled with use and perhaps abuse of psychedelics. In February, I and my friend, whom I will call Tom from now on, got some extra money and decided to buy 300 milligrams of chemically pure 2CE. We both took a dose of 3 to 5 milligrams nasally, although it's hard to tell as we didn't have any kind of tools to measure it. It didn't hurt nearly as bad as many people say, and after all, from our viewpoint, it would have been a waste of drugs to take it orally. It was, apart from a couple of grams of homegrown mushrooms, my first touch to psychedelics. I was amazed at the colors, most of which couldn't possibly exist had we been sober. We laughed more than either of us had laughed in years. We thought about very deep and philosophical things about the very fabric of our universe. It was, to put it simply, fun. The come down wasn't negative at all apart from a little tiredness and sore muscles. We sat on a bench, talked about life and so on. The next four months or so we took 2CE one, two, or sometimes three times a week. During that time I started noticing weird things. My nose was bleeding much more often than normally and every time we took it I had more and more nausea during the come up and the snorting hurt more and more. The high it gave me was getting more familiar and not so much fun anymore, but we kept doing it, and at least I just didn't decide to think about the negative effects. After that time, we had a break from drugs. I still had about 5 or so doses of it in my drawer, but the next time we decided to go do it, it was gone. I searched for it for at least a half an hour, but it was nowhere to be seen. We were both disappointed, so we thought about buying more, but there was none left. There was, however, little eyedrop bottle side plastic cans of 25i N-bomb in a liquid form. We got directions to drop two or three drops in our noses and so we did. I can't remember when we did it for the first time, but I do remember us being happy because it was something new, something other than 2CE. We didn't do it quite as often as we'd done 2CE, maybe once every couple of weeks. I didn't realize it at the time, but I felt a little uncomfortable because there were somewhat similar negative effects to the 25i N-bomb as there had been to 2CE. I didn't have so much nosebleeds, but the nausea was almost as bad as with 2CE, and more so than ever I felt mentally exhausted. Being sober was boring, and while I didn't really want to do more N-bomb, I somehow felt almost as if I had to, simply to cure boredom. 
I had quite a few empty eyedrop bottles in my room and a couple of full ones as well. I think it was a Tuesday. School had just ended and I walked to a train station because I had a therapist meeting I was traveling to. About a minute after the meeting, my friend Tom called, saying that he's coming to the place I was in and that he had a full bottle of 25 N-bomb. I had looked forward to getting home and sleeping for a while, but for some reason I said yes. I didn't have any cigarettes or money to buy a pack and neither did Tom. He was okay, but I had a bit of a craving. I even asked people for a cigarette, but no one gave me one. Me and Tom went to a McDonald's, sat in the backmost table, and he got the bottle out of his pocket and on the table. I said he should take it first, so we opened it up and brought the mouth of the bottle to his nose, tilted his head back, and squeezed. He said nothing came out of the bottle and squeezed more. When he put the bottle back to the table, it was half empty. I should note that each of the bottles contained 5,000 micrograms of 25i, which is about 5 large-ish doses. I startled a bit and asked if he should try and wash it out, but he said no and laughed. I felt like I had no other option but to take the rest myself, and so I did. We got out of McDonald's and he said that he should go see his father before it started coming up. The fastest route to his father would take about 45 minutes and parts of it were always crowded by people. We got on the train and noticed that it already, 5 minutes after taking it, started kicking in. A couple of stops and no more than 4 minutes later we decided there was no way we can go to get his father and got off the train. We both had quite severe nausea and our pupils were already very dilated. We started walking around, waiting for the nausea to stop. It seemed like an hour, but 20 minutes later, the nausea mostly dissipated and we were both higher than ever. We kept talking about everything, of which I can't remember anything. I felt like I had to pee, so I walked to a bush, but for some reason I couldn't pee, so I just decided to keep walking. We kept talking and I remember about a 5 second long time where neither of us talked, and we concentrated on the sound of cars on a nearby road, the sound of the wind and things like that. The complex mix of those sounds, all very distorted and loud, and the visuals which took up our entire eyesights was something indescribable. To this day, I remember each and every detail from those couple of seconds, but can't even begin to describe it, despite being a moment of pure amazement, bliss, and awe. It was the most beautiful thing anyone could ever experience. No matter what beautiful sights you've seen, what good food you've eaten, or the good music you've listened to, this very brief moment would put all that into shadow. At exactly the same time, both of us looked at another and just burst into laughter. There was tears dropping from my eyes because of the pure beauty that moment. We kept on walking and talking, describing to each other how amazing that was. We didn't talk long about it, because when you're that high, you can't concentrate on anything for very long. Every once in a while, my friend just started turning right, walking on other people's yards, and I had to yell for him to come back because, pardon my French, we were completely fucked up and I thought it still hadn't quite reached the plateau, but it was very close. For some reason, the urge to pee suddenly started irritating me. It wasn't so nice of a trip anymore because I couldn't concentrate on anything but the urge to pee. I started walking slower and thoughts like, what if I piss my pants, started filling my head. My friend was telling a funny story and started laughing very hard, but as I didn't answer, he looked back and as soon as he looked at me, he stopped smiling and looked all serious, maybe a bit scared and quickly turned his head back. This took me even deeper into the negative mind space as I was trying to think why he did that. Did I look somehow different? Had I really pissed my pants? What on earth was happening to me? We walked for a while. He walked about 5 meters or 15 feet in front of me, not talking at all. I must have not paid attention because I was thinking about these negative thoughts for a while and when I looked at my friend, he was gone. I stopped and looked around, but he was nowhere to be seen. Didn't we cross a road just now? What if he was too high to realize that there were cars driving? What if he got hit by a car? I thought as soon as these thoughts crossed my head, I felt like my mental self exploded. In a heartbeat, everything was different. I started walking forward, but I couldn't really walk. My legs were like spaghetti, each dropping behind me as the other was supporting my weight. Everything about me and my behavior was utterly bizarre and just wrong. I was very worried about my friend, and it seemed like out of the mush that was once my brain, a thought started to form, like my brain was deep in quicksand, and with the last effort to get it out, it tried to tell me something. Jeans. Pocket. Phone. Phone! That's it, I have to call my friend. And so I took the phone out of my pocket and tried to remember, or being this high, more like guess how it worked, and what I had to do to call Tom. 
Before I could put the screen on, I saw my reflection. My face looked like that of a monster out of the scariest horror movie. My eyes had gigantic eye bags, nose was twisted, mouth was mutilated, and I had a look of some kind of mix of unspeakable fear and panic and anger. I almost screamed, but quickly realized there were a couple of people walking past me, looking at me in disgust and fright. I had to walk to a quieter area, and so I began walking. No matter how hard I tried to look normal, I couldn't control my legs at all. At the same time, I was searching for my friend's number, and when I found it, I called. No answer. I kept calling, but nothing happened. I wasn't sure if I had done something wrong or why the phone wasn't working. It was calling, sure, but my friend just didn't answer for a reason or another. I pressed end called and called again. Nothing. I called again and again, but he simply didn't answer. I was starting to lose all hope, but I kept calling. All of a sudden, it said, the number you have called cannot be reached. What the hell was happening? At that point, my ego had died completely. I was working purely on instinct. Now that I think about it, I don't think I really knew where I was or what was happening. The road I was walking on turned from asphalt to sand and there was a forest to which the road went to. I knew this neighborhood well. After all, my home was about a 5 minute walk away from there. I realized my phone was still in my hand and I started calling again. Now his cell phone was on again, but still no answer. At this point I must have called him at least 20 times. Suddenly, the beeping sound stopped. He answered! It took me a while to realize this and think about what I was going to say, but before I can open my mouth, there was a voice. It wasn't my friend. To me it seemed like it was a witch that was laughing at my despair. It startled me and I quickly ended the call. To this day, I don't know whether it was my friend that was laughing because he thought the two of us getting separated was funny, or if it really was just my imagination. What the fuck is happening? Am I alive? Is this a horrific nightmare? Is this some kind of alternate universe where every time a bit of reality is distorted? I was thinking. I cannot describe how scary it felt. Every aspect of reality and the universe was horribly out of place, wrong, and turned into negative things. When I thought about it, everything had a green tint to it. You know the dirty green color that is used in Disney movies as the color of deadly poisons. That kind of green. It seemed like I was very small compared to everything. Not really physically small, but mentally. It seemed like I was no more than an object for people to look down on and to scoff at. I was the village's crazy guy or criminal. The one that people threw Ron tomatoes and laughed at. The one everyone wanted to torture just for a little while longer until being put to death painfully as possible. I walked for a little while longer until I came to a stump covered in moss. I decided to sit on it and try just once more to reach my friend. I called at least a dozen times, but still no answer. Then, someone answered. I yelled, hello? But before I could say anything, there was the voice of a guy that said, not to me, but to someone else, yeah, the same guy still keeps calling, and then stopped the call. I checked if I had the right number. It did say Tom's name, but I couldn't know for sure if I was hallucinating the whole thing. Wait, I thought, what if this is all just a hallucination? What if I'm not really sitting here? but I'm with my friend somewhere else in the middle of everyone, and he's trying to yell at me so I would wake up from it. I tried to examine my surroundings for anything unreal that would confirm this. I tried to listen very carefully if I could hear my friend talking. Perhaps just hearing it would snap me out of this psychosis-like state, but no luck. It was about at this moment that I, for the first time in at least an hour, realized that I was tripping. It was only a brief moment, maybe a second or two long, after which I fell back again. After a period of time, I didn't know. It happened again, a couple of moments like that later, I realized that I have to pee, and so I started walking 10 meters to a good place for that. During the walk, I forgot what I was doing for at least two or three times and walked back to the stump. It was like every once in a while, I had a brief moment of understanding that I'm alive and at the same time realizing the needs I had like going to take a leak, but after I fell back into it, I'd forgotten completely about it. Anyway, I finally could keep my thoughts together long enough to convince the other side of me to keep walking even though I didn't know why. After I peed, I was somewhat relieved, but somewhat disappointed because it didn't snap me back into the normal world or universe. I started thinking whether I would ever leave this evil alternate universe. I sat there yet for about 20 minutes, after which I decided to keep walking and walk to a park and sit on the bench. It was a brighter place because the trees didn't block the light, and so every time I snapped into reality for a while, I just wanted to bathe in the sun and enjoy the warmth. 
I started remembering thoughts that I had while on the other side, and so realized that I couldn't do anything to stop myself from falling there, but that it was only a trip, and these moments of clarity, which were getting longer and longer, were a sign of it starting to come down. I pictured it so that I was a ball in the universe, and whenever I would fall into the psychotic state, it was because there was another ball, a dark and infinitely malevolent being, which every time it came in contact with me, somehow injected me full of its darkness. This picture was what I thought, partly because I had intense closed eye visuals which showed and described it to me, and partly because to this day, I am convinced that something which creates so much evil and despair could not possibly be just the drug, but the drug would actually be more like a magnet, attracting or calling the dark being that came closer to me. At some point, a father and his son walked past me, and the son being approximately five to seven years old, told his father in a rather loud voice, Look, Dad, that guy is so pale. And the dad answering that, Yeah, we should leave him alone. But at the same time, for under a second, the father looked at me with a facial expression that looked as if he wanted to say, I'm sorry, I can't stay and help you, but I hope you're okay. All these positive things and beautiful sunlight and warmth were very welcoming to me, with the contrast being something so horrific. It felt as every time I had a moment of clarity, it was a bit longer and the moment of darkness being a bit shorter. I was happy I wouldn't have to stay in that horrible place forever, as I had thought at some point in time. Again, I started walking, and walked to a place with a few people, no wind, and benches. The sun had already started coming down. At this point, I didn't really have any moments of darkness anymore. I thought that I would sit here for a couple of hours and then go home to sleep. I was thinking about what had happened when suddenly, my phone started ringing. I looked, and it said Tom's name. I felt sudden happiness because I would finally know where he was, and we could meet up and talk. I answered, and there was a male voice, different from Tom's. He said, have you been calling this number? Yes, what's going on? Were you hanging out with Tom today? Yes, is everything okay? Tom has had a potentially lethal seizure and is in the hospital. Has he done any drugs today? I stuttered in disbelief, not knowing what to say. I don't know why, but I answered, no, not that I know of. Okay, and then he ended the call. I couldn't believe it, what the hell, what? this doesn't make any sense. How could something like this happen, I thought. I became very sad, almost falling into the darkness again. I had the phone still to my ear. I was just looking in distance, shocked. It's impossible to explain what's going through your head when something like this happens. First ego shattered in thousands of pieces and replaced by darkness for hours and just when you're happy because you made it back alive you get to know that your friend might not be as lucky i wanted to shut my mind out of it so i started listening to music i listened to one song for dozens of times while looking in the distance and not even knowing where i should start processing the events that took place after a couple of hours i walked home tried to distract myself by browsing the web but just couldn't I must have stared at the screen for 20 minutes, after which I decided to try and get some sleep. I didn't go to school for a couple of days because I simply didn't have the energy to get out of bed, not talk about sitting in class for hours, listening to the other people laughing at their jokes, wondering if I would think they're funny if it hadn't been for that day. A couple of days later, Tom called, explaining how he had been in the hospital, pumped full of meds, and now going to an involuntary drug rehabilitation program. The moment I heard his voice, an enormous weight was lifted from my shoulders. He said he had just barely survived, and had he been noticed 10 minutes later, he would have probably died. The first thing after this was realizing that I was hungry. I ate something, after which I realized I was very tired, so I slept for at least a good 15 hours. Tom got out of rehab 8 months later, and now likes to smoke a little weed and take a little bit of shrooms every once in a while. After this incident, I had a couple of months of smoking weed whenever I had any, as to somewhat overcome or forget about the depression and stress this had caused me, although now I hardly have any mental trouble compared to that time. Albeit sometimes wanting to do shrooms or LSD, I'm still too traumatized when it comes to psychedelics to use them, and I have a feeling that I will be forever. And I think in the end, it's for the best. Destruction of Thought I had taken 25i multiple times in 1mg doses and unhappy with the experience I had 5 days prior so I decided to kick it up a notch. 
At about 10.30, I stuck the two 1mg blotters in my upper lip and waited for the effects to kick in. I knew about vasoconstriction, but didn't really experience much at 1mg, so I assumed it wouldn't be too bad at this dose. I wanted to make sure that I wouldn't experience any, and had known weed to work well at preventing LSA vasoconstriction, so I smoked some as well about 30 minutes after taking the 25i. At first, I just really felt like a strong stoned feeling. As time went on, I became more anxious, and my body started tingling. I didn't have a watch with me after this time, so I can't be sure how long this period lasted, but it seemed to last for a while. During this period, I took a walk, and soon objects started to start blending together slightly. Lights as well became brighter, and rays of lights were cast fairly far past them. This was a state I was familiar with. As more time passed, I started to become nervous, my head began racing, and that started to frighten me. I know what vasoconstriction feels like, and I wasn't feeling too much effects from that. Had I been sober, I would have known to just ride it out. However, I was not sober. My thought process was starting to deteriorate. I couldn't remember many things about who I was or my life. I was panicking. I woke my mom up and had her drive me to the hospital. There I was asked my date of birth and I could not remember it. Yet strangely, while I could not remember when I was born, I was able to travel to periods of my life. I could think and experience things from my past. Visually, I could see and feel them happening inside my head, though I had no control over where I was going. I struggled to think. I had the doctors reassure me I wasn't going to die, which they did. My memory and perception were both terrible. I couldn't tell what was really going on. Objects were still swirling together, I was seeing very vivid, fractal designs. Perhaps the most interesting part were the closed eye visuals. I could not tell the difference between when my eyes were open or closed. I can't recall what exactly I saw, but it must have very closely resembled the real world, for I cannot differentiate between the two. During this time, I was asked several questions by the doctors, none of which I could answer properly. I didn't like them asking me these questions. If someone said something to me I didn't like, I started to dislike the person, which is not something I ever normally do. The whole time the body load was a bit uncomfortable, it was like an uncomfortable orgasm going on throughout my body. It felt good and bad at the same time. Not of the tingling or pains I had experienced with vasoconstriction, and my veins seemed to be normal size as well as my hands were a healthy red color so I can only assume the feeling was a product of psychological effects of the drug and not any actual physical side effects. Though my memory wasn't very good, so I can't say for sure. Time was at a standstill. Everything seemed to last for an eternity. I kept waiting for myself to die, for everything to end, not sure why I was alive or what I was doing here, yet I kept going. It was like I had no idea what life or my own consciousness was, and I expected it to just seize at any moment. I remember at one point during the night, I couldn't differentiate between words and tangible objects, and it seemed as if I could see words see them, understand them. It was almost like I myself was a word, and as my thought process continued and I thought new things, I became those new words. Another interesting quality was the headspace. Now I have heard this term before but never had it described to me, so I'm not sure if I'm using it correctly. It is the word that best fits though, sorry if it isn't the accurate term. It seemed that my mind was actually physical and I could walk around inside of it which is how I got from one thought to the next. Perhaps this is why I had perceived myself to be words. It was like a big physical area inside my body that I had access to, and I could access any part of it I liked. Well, that's what it seemed like, but as I mentioned before, I had no control what thoughts came into my head. With my memory shot so badly, I assumed that I must have been an alien trapped inside a human's body. Obviously this was not the case, but I couldn't even really remember who I was, and this world seemed so foreign and strange to me, it really seemed like I must have been an alien. While I did not have a clock throughout most of the night, I distinctly remember seeing strong visuals at around 3am when I finally went around to bed. Light seemed to make them stronger, in the dark it just seemed like rays coming out of the alarm clock and extending into the darkness. When I would periodically get up to go to the bathroom though, as soon as I turned on the light, it was like everything in my bathroom was swirling together. 
vivid fractals and blending patterns. The fractals at this time were more fluid than ever and very dark green in color. It was a shade of green I had never seen before and didn't like it to tell the truth. This went on until about 6.30 am. The effects were slowly dissipating. Once they were over, my mind was still racing and it was very hard to get sleep, though that was something I was used to. All in all, it was very enjoyable, even with the doctors nagging me. Once I had their word I wasn't going to die and I would be safe, I would stop worrying. And when I did, most negative aspects of the trip were gone. While I know it wasn't necessary to go to the hospital, I am glad I went because it helped me to get out of the bad part of the trip. I have no idea what my mom thinks of all this. I don't want to talk to her about it again, though I know it will come up. My philosophy on that thought is I would rather be alive and have her upset with me than dead regardless of how she felt. And with that state of mind I was in, I really did feel like I was going to die before I got to the hospital. To be blunt, the effects at 2 mg, even with having taken the drug 5 days prior, were vastly stronger than at 1 mg. At 1 mg, I barely got any visuals. There were some rays casted off objects and some fractals, but nothing vivid, and my perception of the world and my thought process remained fairly normal. I was not prepared for how intense this trip would be, the effects were far more than twice as strong. Be careful when taking higher doses of these chemicals. I have taken it and other psychedelics before, but never experienced something quite like this. While I told my mother and the doctors I wouldn't do it again, I think I will, though I never plan to take that high of a dose with 25i again. If it wasn't for the racing heart rate, I don't think things would have gone out of hand at the beginning. Still a great experience though, and again despite my mom finding out and going to the hospital, I think it was worth it. I wish I could put this into better words, but the psychedelic experience is something I have a lot of trouble describing, and my memory of the time isn't the best. 48 Hours of Madness Before starting this story, I would like to preface by saying that this sort of binging and mixing behavior shouldn't be encouraged at all and I personally strongly advise others to learn from my mistakes in this report. It was my 19th birthday when this started. I had organized to meet up with two old friends who I hadn't seen for quite some time due to our studies moving us away from each other. In the past, we always had a fun time together, often having long drug fuel nights of ridiculous ideas, hatching of almost insane concepts, and ideas for increasingly bizarre creative projects and it was always a great time. Our usual substances of choice would be a cocktail of ketamine, weed, and cocaine, the ratios of each depending on the mood of the night. But this time, as a special treat, I had gotten a hold of some LSD that I was assured was some high strength product that I was excited to try out with them. I was at this point familiar with psychedelic substances such as Lucy, shrooms, and mescaline, but my other two friends, who we will call Chris and Ella, for the purposes of this story, hadn't tried quite as much. On the day of my birthday, I met up with Ella in the center of our city to go get a tattoo with. I have built a tradition at this point to get a tattoo every year on my birthday. On the walk there, we tallied up how much of what we had in total to share between us that evening. After some calculations, we figured that we had about 3 grams of ket, 2 grams of coke, roughly 600 micrograms of LSD each for the evening. Alongside God knows how much weed to spare, three tablets MDMA of 60 milligrams each, about 30 canisters of nitrous oxide lying around, as well as a bottle of amyl nitrate. This was a serious stash for three people and one night. Once we realized how much we had, we knew we were in for one hell of a night was looking to be my best birthday yet, but boy, was I mistaken. While me and Ella were still on the way to get my appointment done, we decided we may as well have a key of Ket, purely for the novelty of getting a tattoo done while bumped up on Special K. We headed down a more quiet alley the street over from the parlor, where she pulled out a decent-sized bag of Ket, and I grabbed my keys from my pocket. We both took a pretty sizable bump, cleaned up our noses, and headed into the parlor. For reference, this is not something you should do. While signing the paperwork for a tattoo before you get it done, 
Most forms will have a line saying that if you sign, you are not under the influence of any drugs or alcohol. Doing this is a very stupid idea and generally disrespectful to the artist in retrospect from my part. I was filling out the various papers and handing over my pre-established design as I started to feel the gentle buzz creep into my mind. By the time we were set up and sat down for the work to start, Ella was very preoccupied by something outside the window and my reflexes were noticeably slowed down. The artist started working and I could feel the familiar feeling of watching yourself doing what you're currently doing but as if you're watching a film from a camera behind you. I felt next to no pain from the needle despite it being on the bone of my wrist to my artist's surprise. The session was short as the design was fairly small. It took us both a couple of seconds to stand up but once we had paid we made it back outside without a hitch. When I talked to the artist another time, he said he could tell we weren't quite on the planet, but he wouldn't take any offense and promised not to tell his boss, which would have probably had us banned from the parlor. After we walked back into town, we took a couple more bumps of K on the journey. Now both of us truly floating a couple inches off the ground, our bodies not feeling like our own, just wandering around town until Chris got off work and our evening could start properly. Sometime later, we received a text from him saying he had finished off a bit early and we could go meet him in a bar. It was about 20 minutes walking from where we were to meet him before we headed back to their apartment. When we got there, about an hour later, our mental state hindering our walking speed a little, Chris had already had a drink with a friend of his from work who I had met a couple times before, but didn't feel entirely comfortable around him in general. It was nothing from him as a person, he was nice enough, we just didn't vibe it especially well. We had different senses of humor and interest, nothing radically serious. Me and Ella were anxious to get off home and kick off the night fully, but we were hung at the bar for some amount of time. The recollection of how long it was escapes me totally. When we were ready to go, Chris said, Oh, Jack, his friend from work, is going to come with us for a bit and have a drink before heading off seemingly from nowhere without consulting me or Ella beforehand. We went along with this proposition since it seemed a little harsh to just tell him to go home. The journey back to our apartment now sits as a bit of a blur in my memory. I remember me and Ella hitting Marquette before getting on the subway and finding the sunset and alternating light of the subway very disorienting and the 15 minute journey feeling like we had been going on for hours. We finally made it back just as darkness was coming in and the street lights were coming on. When we were inside, Ella and I had a brief talk about how neither of us were especially comfortable with Jack being there, but thought we could wait until he headed home before we kicked things up a gear. After having a small meal to line our stomachs a little, we sat around together making general conversation and watching a couple shows. The cat had worn off me and Ella at this point, so we decided to share a couple joints together to help us unwind in what had become a strangely tense atmosphere that we had noticed, but Chris hadn't at all. He and Jack had carried on drinking once we had come home, so they were starting to get pretty drunk. It was then that we decided to head into the bathroom and hit some more K. So I decided to have some of the LSD I had stored in my bag. I cut off myself a tab and a half as a starter and popped it under my tongue. A couple lines of K laid out for when it started hitting. At the time, my tolerance for LSD had been built up pretty high due to very regular intake, so this didn't occur to me to be an especially intense trip. I waited until the blotters had dissolved in my mouth before having a line of ketamine laid out on a plate in front of me. While Ella sat on her bed, her mind slowly leaving her body as her eyes gently rolled around the room over and over. My mind seemed to have settled down a lot with the changing of the rooms, so I decided to have another two tabs of acid. Now having ingested maybe 400 micrograms plus of double dipped strong acid, but I realized that the tabs tasted of something, but I had dismissed it as just a taste left over from the food and weed, but this was a strange bitter taste that couldn't have come from that. Suddenly, my sluggish drug addled brain realized that I recognized the flavor to be the flavor of 25i N-bomb, 
also known as M-Bomb. Fuck, while my tolerance for LSD might have been high, there was no way I was prepared for a high strength unknown amount of N-Bomb to be filling my head. I wrestled with my mind not to panic, to try to keep calm and relax because panicking wouldn't help anyone in this situation. I looked around for something to use as an anchor to help bring some calm to myself but my eye was caught by the small, in my eyes, mound of ket and a plastic straw left on the plate in front of me. As I'm sure many people know, when your mind is in such a state, you definitely don't think through some decisions quite as much as would be best in the situation. I said to Ella, you okay if I finish this bit off? She replied in the small mumble I didn't catch. She was far too gone to communicate properly, so I ducked down and swept it all up. In retrospect, this was no small amount of ketamine, but it was probably close to about 500 milligrams. As I went back against the wall, I could feel something weird tugging at the back of my mind. I knew something big was coming. I approached with increasing speed faster and faster. I could feel my breathing become more rapid and panicked, and in an instant I knew I was gone. I fell down into the deep darkness that is a serious K-hole. But this was different to my previous experiences in the K-hole blackness. I found myself in a fully waking dream state. I was standing in the middle of a large hall. There were cold marble slabs under my bare feet and a gentle hum of chanting and singing which had a deeply spiritual feel which resonated in what felt like the core of my soul. I looked around. I found myself in some huge temple. The ceiling reached far, far overhead and the characteristics of the place seemed to be mixed with Middle Eastern Islamic and Indian influences, mixed with classic Gothic architecture with the patterns and images etched into the smooth pale marble, which made the structure. To my left, there was a solid wall, but on my right, it was a series of columns, looking out onto a breathtakingly beautiful sunset over a flourishing countryside which gently flooded the white marble with an elegant, calm golden light of a serene, quiet twilight. At the other end of the hall, there was a large archway which led to another selection of the monastery. But, as I looked down toward it, a figure in dark robes slowly walked into my vision. Their deep hood pulled far over their face, holding a swinging incense burner. They turned to look at me, but shadow enshrouded any facial features they might have had. As sinister as the figure looked, when they carried on walking, I felt a great need to follow them, and so I passed through the hall to another room. The next hall was even vaster than the last, with several steps leading down to the floor level. Across the hall, there were two chairs laid out and a marble chest table built straight into the floor set in between them, and there was a shape of a figure draped in long flowing ever-shifting ebony robes sitting in one of the chairs with its back to me. As my eyes fell upon the figure, I was filled to my core with an unescapable dread and primal fear which resonated from the essence of my being. Yet, I didn't choose to run, but felt drawn to fill the other chair. As I crossed the room, several of the other hooded monk figures replicated the movements of the first one between the columns to my right. Walking out, looking at me, then proceeding to disappear behind the pillar in front of them. I sat myself down opposite of the figure, and it dawned on me that this was death itself in a form my mind could understand, and the game we were going to play was for my own life. This was limbo, and I was stuck here until the game was finished, and that would dictate if I was going to live or die. The game proceeded with death letting me move first, but when death made their first move, I was suddenly sucked straight from that scene, and I realized I had been transported somewhere. I was outside in the middle of nowhere. It was snowing heavily, and the snow was several feet deep. I had misstepped while walking and fallen into a small ravine. My right leg was stuck in between two slabs of stone under the snowdrift. The stone was crushing my bones and cutting into my flesh just above my knee, and the snow was getting heavier as light vanished quickly from the day. I could feel the cold setting into my bones. If I didn't do something drastic soon, I would be dead within minutes. I felt the final warmth of a body dying of hypothermia blast through my body and from somewhere dragged a spurt of adrenaline and heave my leg free. 
snapping several bones and leaving me in screaming agony, but I had made it out. I pulled myself forward through the snow, lying face down dragging forward with my hands, desperate to survive. Then I was back at the chess table, death letting go of their piece from the first move. I understood then that for every move death made, I would be put in a situation similar to the last one where I would have to prove that I wanted to cling on to life and show them that I was worth of being given it. In the past, I have had several suicidal thoughts and actually attempted suicide several times earlier in life to no avail, but for some reason right now, I would have done anything to stay alive. I made my next move trying to focus on the game, then death reached forward for their next move the background chanting growing louder around us. Again, I was pulled out of the temple and into another situation where I was fighting for my life with every essence of my being. I sadly can't recall what these other situations were as clearly as the first one, but each held its own new set of challenges, stressing different parts of my physical and mental strength. As they proceeded, I felt like this was more than just my body and this life I was playing for, but my actual soul itself. Like, if I lost this, then I would never live again, and my soul would be held trapped in eternal torment forevermore. The next I remember is being released. I don't remember winning the game, but I guess I must have proven worthy of living on into the future for some reason. Suddenly, I was back in the real world. My head jerked up, and I was still in the same position as before. But before I can move properly, I have to lurch over to the bin in Ella's room to throw up whatever food was left in my stomach from earlier. I still have no idea how much time had passed, but it was long enough for Ella to have some of her senses back. When she heard me puking, she went over the bed to ask if I was okay. I said I just had the craziest experience, but I couldn't explain it right now. I just needed some water and some fresh air maybe. I knew that was enough kept for me for the night, but the M-bomb was just starting to get a hold of me. There was much more night to go.